All right, what's up, everybody? Good morning. Welcome to the show. Today is Thursday, July 20th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 412 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, <clears throat> me, you, LegoSec, Michael Huskins, Senfilis, Dwayne Williams, not only IT, Jenny Housley, the mod team, folks on LinkedIn, folks on YouTube, Simply Cyber squad members, community members, first timers and long timers alike are going to be shredding the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break into the industry, there's going to be value for you here. I guarantee you, not only are you going to be asked, how do you stay current and relevant in cybersecurity at any job interview, you'll also be able to know, you know, kind of like what the current temperature is of the industry. You'll learn terminology, concepts, threat actors, great networking. The Simply Cyber community members up in chat are always bringing the heat, team live and team replay alike. So it's going to be a great experience. Believe that. And we've got a banger of a show lined up for you today. Uh, <clears throat> before we do get into the show, though, I would like to do one small thing. Um, certainly not for anything small in general. So for those of you who do not know, uh, this is Kevin Mitnick right here. The other guy is me. Uh, this was taken at DEF CON in uh, 2016, I believe. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet Kevin. Uh, I got one of Kevin's like, uh, like very uh, desirable. This is his business card, right? I don't know if you can see it, but basically it's his business card and it's a lockpick kit, but it's got his contact information and stuff on it. Uh, Kevin, really cool guy. Unfortunately... Uh, our community lost Kevin uh, yesterday. Uh, he's been battling uh, pancreatic cancer and uh, unfortunately lost that battle. Uh, Kevin is uh, legendary in our industry. He was one of the very first people uh, to really get on the scene and make <clears throat> hacking a thing. Uh, he started in 79. Um, you know, he, he was kind of of that first wave of hackers, if you will, who were freakers, uh, you know, hacking the phone systems, Ma Bell, different tones. Um, he did serve some time in prison. He's also one of those like uh, reclamation stories where went to prison and then got out and became kind of a white hat hacker, kind of uh, the same thing as the catch me as you can guy where he went to go work for the good guys. Um, very, very charismatic individual. I've seen him speak at conferences, uh, a lot of fun. He, you know, kind of had a flair for, um, showmanship as well. Uh, just really, a uh, good, good, good guy. <clears throat> so unfortunately, uh, lost his battle with cancer, as I said. So if, if it's okay, uh, with the community, what I would love to do is take a moment, um, of silence and just, um, you know, recognize Kevin and, and give him his due. So, <clears throat> A uh, moment of silence, if you would, please. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate that. I see James McQuiggan in chat with the Super Chat. Kevin will be missed. If you haven't read Ghost in the Wire, go check it out. It's about his life as a hacker and how he reformed. Rest in peace, legend. Let's see. Kevin wrote several books. Uh, I actually have a couple of them. Uh, this is Kevin Mick's Ghost in the Wires. So I'll go ahead and drop a link in chat for this one. Ghost in the Wires. <clears throat> go ahead and check it out. If you're interested in learning more about this guy, uh, like I said, charismatic, representative. If you've worked in the industry for a bit, you know exactly who Kevin is. Uh, he was <laughs> he was known to everybody. <clears throat> I saw him live hack a, a company uh, over the phone at a conference. Really cool. All right, guys. Let me see. Uh, so we've got a great show for you, uh, as always. 
But before we get into it, I do want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsor, starting with my good friend Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Go check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. Also want to say holla, holla, holla to Panopsi Security. I actually had a phone call with Brandon Poole last night talking about business. Brandon will not be at Vegas at Hacker Summer Camp this year, uh, but he sends his he sends his well wishes to all of us. Panopsi Security can help any business and you uh, level up your game through their quantified risk assessment methodology. Now, you might be like, what do I need a quantified risk assessment for? Here's the deal. If you're just being reactive in your information security program, if you're just green, if if you have heard the business say the words green field, then a quantified risk assessment is absolutely an excellent idea for you. It'll lay out a three-year roadmap on how you can approach in a structured um a structured, deliberate way of implementing your security controls that will uh, maximize cyber risk reduction while being mindful of resources like money, people, and time. Because those are the three things that are, you know, expenses when you're <clears throat> trying to put a cyber program in place. To put it in perspective, I once had a CISO tell me, I don't want a huge budget because <laughs> if I have a huge budget, then the board is going to think that I can do all the things. And time and people are also a constraint. So um, it's not just all about cash money. All right, oh, hold on. Straight cash, homie. It's not about straight cash, homie. Sometimes it's about uh, being deliberate and delivering cyber risk reduction for yourself. Uh, James McQuiggan, I do want to say... Can we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, thank you, James, uh, for the super chat again. And uh, again, rest in peace, Kevin. Uh, Anti-Siphon Training is also a, sh a sponsor. Love those guys over at Black Hills but more about them at the mid-roll. If you are live in chat, hashtag team live, I see 153 of you gorgeous people on this Thursday morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, expecting another 100 to roll in here as we get the show up and going. Uh, hashtag team live in chat. Each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth half a CPE. So that's two and a half a week, assuming a five-day week, uh, 10 a month on average. So be sure to say what's up in chat. And if you don't know what to say, just say hashtag team live. If you're really shy, hashtag passive observer. Say what's up. Take a screen cap. File it away. File uh, your CPEs. And if they ever audit you, boom, there you go. You got the evidence to support it. If you are, um, if it's your first time here, hashtag first timer in chat. I love, I'm like really on the first timer kick right now. As many of you have observed over the last couple uh, weeks. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm working my A off in order to try to reach as many people as possible and bring them into the Simply Cyber community. And most importantly, deliver this, like obviously Simply Cyber has got a ton of different stuff going on, but this morning broadcast is so valuable from a networking perspective and from a staying current perspective that I'm like busting my butt trying to get more people there. So hashtag first timer, if it's your first time here, let us know in chat and please let's welcome them. Hey, Jerry Smith, good to see you. What's up? Wow. Love it, love it, love it. Hey, Jamie Fleck, good to see you. All right, guys, like I said, we got a great show for you today. It is Thursday, which is, um, which means um, every day of the week has a little special segment unique to the day. Today is Dan Reardon, AKA Haircut Fishes meme of the week now this is a meme that dan makes uh independent of me and i do not censor it or screen it it gets dropped in my inbox on thursday morning dan has been consistent uh both with his delivery and with his quality and today is going to be a good one i loved today when i saw it um so stay tuned for the mid roll where you'll get your meme of the week great great job dan uh if you're listening all right guys with that, why don't you settle in, carry Jessica Goodwin over on LinkedIn, Space Tacos, the All of Team Live. Settle in and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us in an awesome wave. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. 
It's Thursday, July 20th, 2023. Complex DDoS attacks on the rise. According to a new report from Cloudflare, the number of DDoS requests in Q2 increased 15% on the quarter to 5.4 trillion, although for some context, that did fall 35% on the year. The complexity and length of these attacks saw a bigger jump, with attacks exceeding three hours, increasing 103% on the quarter. When digging into specific industries, a much larger spike becomes visible. Cryptocurrency companies saw a almost 600% increase in DDoS attacks on the year, with gaming and gambling industries also seeing increased attacks. Cloudflare also noted that the rise in virtual machine botnets in DDoS attacks rather than using infected smart devices. These can use a much smaller number of infected devices to launch powerful attacks. Interesting. Am I okay, so um, again, I... I didn't say it in the intro, but I do not review or prepare for these stories. So I am seeing them with you for the first time and reacting to them in real time. Um, when I saw this, honestly, I was going to even pause the story and just say, oh, that anonymous Sudan. Um, anonymous Sudan is a, a nation state threat actor, and they've been in uh, they've been doing a lot of denial of service attacks. Killnet, Russia's Killnet has been doing a lot of denial of service attacks um, this year. So I could easily like I could easily believe and see why there would be an uptick in uh, quarter over quarter growth in denial of service attacks. It is important to note that everything is in is in context. So it's still lower than it was at the end of 2022 at seven and a half and six and a half trillion. When they say trillion, by the way, if I had to assume they're talking about packets. Uh, so if you're familiar with your network layers, um, packets across the wire. Um, that's what, that's how you do a denial of service attack. Um, but interestingly enough, they said they do call out Killnet. They do call out anonymous Sudan, uh, which is nice. Uh, but they said it's actually, uh, attacking crypto and the gambling community, which is really interesting. I could see crypto, right? Because if you think, think about it for a hot minute, right? Um, well, let me take a step back for those who are new to the industry or not really up on what this is. Denial of service attack is basically just over what, like in most, there's different ways to do it. But the one that we're most often talking about is where you send a overwhelming amount of data to a server, to an endpoint, and it, it can't handle the load, right? If you've ever tried to like buy Taylor Swift tickets from Ticketmaster uh, <laughs> and like, you know, Ticketmaster is not refreshing. Uh, it's because it's essentially a denial of service attack. If you've played Haiku with me on Monday, sometimes we DOS the server there, okay? It's just, that's all it is. It's kind of a crude attack, but it is effective. Why would you want to do this? Well, if you're, um, if you're trying to threaten someone like Russia was doing to Ukraine at the start of the war, you might overwhelm their government websites. You might overwhelm uh, some service like, like Ticketmaster so people can't get it, right? Deny them that service. But if you think about it for gambling or for crypto, right? If if you're doing like stock trades, right? And the stock trade transaction needs to clear uh, before something can happen. If you can overwhelm the service, maybe the price changes before the clearing happens. And now you've made an extra couple bucks or whatever. And again, I say this almost every single day, but whenever you're thinking about why someone's attacking, Great cash, homie. Follow the money. It's almost always about the money. Yes, there's occasionally there's ideological motivated people. Anonymous does things. Um, there has been ideological, but most times I'd say like 90%. It's, it's, it's straight cash home. It's all about the Benjamins. So when we're talking about why denial of service attacks are happening, um, it, it's probably money related in some way. They did mention gambling as well. I would have to assume that that is also... Um, for online gambling, like think of FanDuel or something like that, which by the way, if FanDuel wants to sponsor, no thanks. <laughs> I'm not big. I, I don't know why there's this massive trend in the YouTube sphere or, or Twitch sphere around like slots and gambling. But anyways, I digress. Um, if you're an online betting business and people cannot get to your business to bet, that's not good for business. So you can start to hold businesses hostage or extort them. Uh, Pay them a you get them to pay you a protection fee uh, to protect them from getting denial of service attack, but you're the one who's actually doing it. So that's what all this is. Cloudflare is kind of the front runner in the game around uh, handling denial of service attacks. 
TLDR here. You should know if you're going to work in our industry, you should know what denial of service attacks are. And that's enough. Okay, let's keep going. My six warns of Chinese data traps. MI6 had Richard Moore warned of countries potentially entering into data traps with the Chinese government, potentially leaving these nations vulnerable to further influence from the country. He cited China requiring countries buying COVID-19 vaccines to share their vaccination data sets as an example. MI6 fears access to these data sets could give China a further scale advantage when it comes to training emerging machine learning tools. More claim China can further speed development of these tools as Chinese authorities are not hugely troubled by questions of personal privacy or individual data security. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, this is pretty interesting. So <clears throat> if you haven't been following, again, I do say this regularly. Uh, we do We walk right up to the edge of political stories, but I try not to go over the edge because uh, this isn't a political show. This is a cybersecurity news show. All right. So head of MI6, which is like uh, UK CIA, if, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I believe it is. If my UK friends in chat can um, clarify, let me know. But I, I'm pretty sure um, MI6 is like the CIA for uh, UK. They're saying that China's setting data traps. So if, if you haven't been paying attention, China is like the front runner they're like in first and second place for data theft and espionage right like they are sucking up all the data whether it's healthcare data research um nuclear energy uh right i mean they have a really big population and a really aging population and uh they, you know they have plans for their country and having information we, we just left the information age, guys, right? Like it, data is as valuable as anything else, any resource on the planet. Data is absolutely uh, one of the top ones. So yeah, China can steal through espionage and cyber attacks and stuff like that. But why limit themselves to just uh, those type of attacks when they can actually... Uh, put in contracts that you have to share data with them if you're going to use their stuff. China has been moving very, very um, strongly into building infrastructure in Africa. If you haven't been following this also in Australia. Uh, so China's China's growing quite, quite a bit. Uh, like, so here's the thing. They're not building Chinese things in Africa, but they are funding infrastructure projects in Africa. And then some people are positing that when those countries or if those countries fault on their debt for those infrastructure projects, then China will take ownership of it and then effectively own, you know, airports and stuff in uh, the in African countries. So they are they are moving in a very um, complicated way to you know have reach, get data, um, and all they're saying here is watch out for these data traps. This is more of an interesting story. You know who this would be interesting for? So how do we how do we operationalize this, Jerry? Right? Here's what I would say: like many of us on this call are are not um, working at the executive level of you know you know five I first world power governments. And if you are, shout out in chat. Like that's awesome that you're doing that. But we can use this lesson learned in a micro way for ourselves. This is a GRC thing all day, every day. This is a GRC thing. When you are setting up contracts and relationships with other partners, right? Uh, this is specifically for GRC. If you're setting up a data use agreement, if you're signing up to use like box.com or Dropbox, if you're gonna put your data in another party's control, you absolutely need to have terms around how that data is gonna be used, who's gonna have access to that data, the ability to audit who's accessed that data. When you're terminating the agreement that that data gets returned to you and deleted from their servers, right? Like most people are just like, ooh, just sign the contract. Let's get going. Yeah, party, let's move this data. We wanna move fast and break things. And it's like, yeah, I hate to be, you know, the wet blanket here. I hate to be sand in your shorts, you know, uh, dev team, but how about we get some terms in place and understand how, the life cycle of the data that's going to be generated here before we go all YOLO up in your project. And most, by the way, just now I'm getting a little angry. Like, 
just as an aside, you know what really grinds my gears? I like, and I get it. I get it. Move fast, break things. But it, you know what's so annoying when like a team is like, yeah, like let's fire it up. And like, they're like, oh my God, Jerry, you're like holding us back. Like with this contract. Ugh. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And then they're like, fine, finally, let's go, 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 go. And then like after two weeks, they're like, huh, you know, this isn't actually working the way we thought, or this isn't paying dividends or whatever. And then they're just like, Ugh, and like walk away and leave it. And they just leave like this mess that continues to cost money. We've got this data all up in there now that I have to go retrieve or have conversations with the business about them complying with the terms of the agreement that I forced to get in there. And then the dev team, or it could not be the dev team. It's different teams all the time. But like that that team is like now all geeked up about another project and and like, oh God. That you want to talk about um hashtag like GRC life or FML. That is what like this isn't even in my GRC course, but um that what I just explained is like one element of GRC work that is painful. It is painful. Um ugh. Hashtag preach. Microsoft expands cloud log access. Traditionally, Microsoft offered advanced logging access as a feature to licensees of its Purview Audit Premium tier. However, after Chinese-linked threat actors stole a Microsoft signing key that was later used to breach exchange accounts, the company will broaden access. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency worked with Microsoft to find critical logging data points. These will be included for free to all cloud customers starting in September 2023. Logs will include email access and 30 other data points. Microsoft will also increase the retention period for audit standard customers to 180 days by default. Microsoft will still offer greater API access, forensic tools, and more data points to Purview Audit Premium subscribers. Cool. So, I mean, <laughs> all right. I mean... Before before we um, throw our shoulder out patting Microsoft on the back, this uh, advanced level of logging used to be a paid feature. And the argument was that the level of logging that you had to pay for was minimum logging to be able to do a proper analysis on whether or not you've been compromised. So... I'm sure Microsoft received some external pressure, probably from CISA, since they were working with CISA, or from the executive branch, or from you know power brokers in Fortune 500. I know they didn't mention Jen Easterly, but I'm going to give Jen Easterly some love here. There's Jen in chat. So good job, Microsoft, um, for making this logging data free. Um, it's, it's under the purview. Again, when I think about what Microsoft's doing, they are highly motivated cash, to get everybody and everyone and all businesses up into Azure, up into the cloud, get off on-prem. It's all about those subscription dollars, baby. It's all about that monthly recurring revenue, not this one-time cost for licensures. Uh, and that's Microsoft's business model. So no surprise. Um, the Chinese hacker is getting in and uh, getting that gold like key. Um, they're still in, uh, as far as I know, Microsoft is still investigating whether uh, how that happened. But um, you know, whatever. So if you are using Azure, you may want to go check out your um, your Azure, you know, I guess administration panel. I'm sure there's going to be some pop up when you log in. Microsoft. Here's an I. There'll be a pop-up that says like, ooh, new advanced logging feature, like free for you, right? The, I'm sure the marketing team got their hands all up in it. Uh, here it is, Microsoft Purview Audit. Um, Microsoft's always making modifications and changes all up in um, in Azure. Like you log into Azure and it's always like something crazy going on in there. Um, here, I'm going to just drop a link in chat for anyone that is using Office 360, not Office 365, using Azure. Uh, check it out. You know if you are, right? Like, like you wouldn't be like, oh, I am? No, no, no. Like, it's, this isn't like having a random Fortinet network device on your network. This is like your, your business is in Azure or your business isn't in Azure. <laughs> there's, no, there's no gray area there. All right, let's keep going. Broadcom's VMware acquisition. Gets oh, also as a side note, I, I just want to give a shout out. Um, Neil Bridges, who uh, runs the cyber and security community, he, had, he was... He, 
he is a streamer on Twitch. He did YouTube for a minute and then he went back to Twitch. Uh, and he posts on social media and stuff. He had kind of like uh, pulled back the the reins a little bit on providing, you know, I guess content to the our community. But I did notice Neil, uh, he's doing like, I don't even know how to do it because I'm too old, but like um, those TikTok videos where like you're standing in front of a green screen, but like the news story is behind you or like, you know, like your screen is behind you, whatever. Um, and Neil is doing like short little hot takes on news, cyber news stories. And I saw that he did this. He didn't do this one with the auditing, but he did the Microsoft, uh, like golden ticket getting compromised by China. And he did another one and he streamed the other last Tuesday night. Um, so anyways, if you don't know about Neil Bridges or cyber insecurity, uh, go check it out. Uh, he, he's, he delivers awesome, uh, awesome content, great takes. And a uh, big fan. Uh, 90 Second News, I guess, is what he's calling it now. Uh, I don't know if that's like a new initiative or he's just dabbling. I don't know. Uh, BSEC, if you could, uh, can you drop a um, drop a link to cyber insecurity in chat, if you would? So if you like, if you like what I'm doing here and you want more of of something like this, Neil Neil's doing something like this. It's it's Neil and I are two different people with, <laughs> with two different approaches. But Neil does great work, and um, it, it's just great to see Neil back back on the streaming horse, if as it were. UK Green Light, the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, announced it took an initial view that Broadcom's proposed acquisition of VMware would not substantially reduce competition. Essentially, the regulator found that any use of VMware's assets to hamper competition would be more than offset by losses to Broadcom's business. The CMA will consult on these findings and issue a final decision on September 12th. The EU regulators already approved the deal last week, and we still need to hear from the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, which may still sue to block the deal. All right. And now... So, I mean, what? all right. I, I don't even know what to say about this, dude. Like, $61 billion. $61 billion. Like, that doesn't even... I, I can't even, uh, like... Uh, what? My brain doesn't work when I try to think about that amount of money, right? Like $61 million, I can kind of wrap my head around, but it would still be like, like I would look, okay, I would look like the wolf in the like 1950s cartoons that looks at the attractive dancing girl and like the eyes bulge out and pop out of the head and then like steam comes out of the ears, that guy. That would be me if someone handed me $61 million, $61 billion. I, my heart might explode. I, I don't even know what I would do. Um, so these numbers are silly numbers. Um, same with the Activision, Microsoft Activision Blizzard merger thing. That's upwards of like $60 billion. So I don't know what the hell. I, I, I don't know where this money comes from. It's like insane. But um I have no idea why Broadcom, a chip manufacturer, is wanting to spend the, the the equivalent of like most countries' GDP to acquire a software company. But believe me, I'm positive that the people at Broadcom are certainly going to be making more than $61 billion from this investment, right? Nobody invests a dollar and hopes to get 50 cents back, right? Everyone invests a dollar expecting to get ten dollars back so if broadcom broadcom spending 61 billion dollars um you know bombs away for the executives at broadcom because they're going to be getting a new boat and a new beach house i mean what do you do with that money like could you buy a planet like what do you do with that money that's insane like at some point at some point isn't it i i, I don't even want to say it, it's enough because like go get that money dude capitalism go get it but like at some point like if you have if you have, I, and I know this is a company, not an individual, but just bear with me. Like when you have a hundred million dollars, wh what is, what's, what's five million dollars do for you there? Like, what are you doing there? And I guess what you do, if we look at case study is you build a space shuttle program. That seems to be the hot thing. If you've got, <laughs> if you've got billions of dollars, you build a space shuttle program. Um, so yeah, I don't know why I'm losing my mind about this, uh, Great cash, homie. maybe because I didn't, there's nothing really from a story perspective to see if they merge. Great. If they don't great, like this doesn't impact me or you 
in any meaningful way, uh, unless you own stock in one of these two, go get it. All right, here we go. Yeah, buy an island. I know, like, I have heard, I have heard that um, there are restrictions, right? Like, 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 like Elon Musk, he can't just buy Montana, okay? You can't just, you couldn't, like, these wealthy people, like, there's rules in place. You can't just go to Montana and offer every citizen who owns land, you know, 5x whatever their property's worth, right? So my house is worth $100,000. I'll give you half a million. And, and just do that across the entire state. And now you own all the property in Montana. You can't do that legally uh, because you'd start your own country at that point, right? You can't buy Texas. So, I mean, like, uh, ah, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm short circuiting right now. Just thinking about this. Sorry. I just, I feel it bad that I just like made you all experience what I just, ah. A word from our sponsor, OpenVPN. Kareem Hakim, CTO at Hakim Mizerpako, says that Cloud Connexa has given him some long sought peace of mind. OpenVPN has helped my company to access remote nodes securely without worrying about security protocols. He says, my company has been looking for a similar solution for years, and we finally got what we were looking for. Read more at the link in our show notes. Oh my God. Okay. Google. All right. So really quickly, one, like, I don't know if it's the coffee. I don't know if it's the lights. I don't know if it's that story, but I am like full blown sweating. <laughs> I am like... I am running hot right now. Holy Jesus. All right. Well, welcome to the mid-roll, everybody. We do this every day. So hashtag first timers. Get, get some of this. Hey, 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 hey. Want to say shout out to Jack Scott, my good friend Jack's co-author, partner in crime on many different uh, initiatives. Great to see you in chat, Jax. Congratulations on your master's degree as well. Guys, I want to thank you all for being here today on Thursday, July 20th. If you're getting value out of the stream, holla, 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 and hit that like button. Not for my own vanity, not for metrics. By hitting the like button, if enough of you do it, you will trigger the YouTube algorithm. You will trigger the YouTube algorithm and um, other people will find what we're doing here. If you're a first timer, you may have found this because of what people did yesterday. You, you, you feel me? It's, 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 it's part of the YouTube game or whatever, but we have enough of us here, 260 of us, where we can influence how YouTube finds more people. So do me a favor, hit the like button. It goes a long way and it pays it forward for our community. I want to thank the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, I, I love Eric. I love Brandon. They're the CEOs of those companies. Um, I stand by them, and uh, I, you know, I'm proud to be affiliated with them. Also proud to be affiliated with Anti Siphon Training, the Black Hills Information Security Company. Uh, this is a department within Black Hills. So if you've heard of John Strand or Black Hills, let's get John Strand emotes going. John Strand, another legend in the industry. Uh, his company offers information security training. Go check out Anti-Siphon. There is a link in the description below. If you click it, a little a little ticker gets counted. So please click that button so I can uh, show Black Hills that you know people are actually using the button. Uh, they have live training and then they have pay what you can training. And I want to call your attention to the pay what you can training. They have eight different courses that are pay what you can. What does pay what you can mean? It literally is exactly what it sounds like. You pay what you can. If you can pay five dollars. Guess what? Sock core skills with John Strand, five bucks. If you could pay three hundred dollars, if your business is go if your company is going to reimburse you for this training and you want to pay five hundred dollars, pay five hundred dollars. Pay what you can. Right? And you can see they've got a different they have a cyber ranges where you can learn and stuff like that, but they actually have an upcoming one um, on MITRE skills in August right here. MITRE Attack Framework. I will be taking this one. Um, on August 24th, um, I got some big news for the community that I, I'm I, I'm trying to put together to, to communicate to you, but uh, I'm not ready for that. But I, I will be in this. I will be in this one. I'm going to make every effort to be in this one. So check it out. Anti-siphon training. Love it. Love it. Love it. 
Guys, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, Billy DP. Good luck, Billy, getting four wisdom teeth ripped out um, of his mouth right now. But he currently had the baton. Jeez, uh, Jesus Quintero, for, hashtag first timer. Great to see you, Jesus. Um, all right, guys, here's the deal. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Billy DP had the, the, the baton yesterday and posted it. Um, he is unable to tag somebody. I am going to be tagging someone on his behalf. I'm really happy for this opportunity. I would like to tag Boston Rob. Boston Rob is a longtime Simply Cyber community member, lives in San Diego. Guy surfs his butt off. He picked me up at the airport when I flew into San Diego a couple months ago. I got to spend time with him uh, and his son. Really cool guy, really nice guy, uh, great stories. So Boston Rob, uh, he's Team Replay. So uh, Rob, I know you watch every day, so grab up the community challenge. Guys, go on LinkedIn, search for the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Connect with the people who are posting both the original poster and the people in comments. You yourself should comment. So when people connect with people in the comments, they're also connecting with you. This will build your this will build your um your your professional network and you will see your LinkedIn feed change considerably for the better. Now um the final thing I want to share with you is every single Thursday, Dan Reardon, aka Haircut Fish. Um, makes a custom meme. So if you're new here, hey Zeus, we do this just on Thursdays. And uh, <laughs> earlier this week, I talked about uh, ASL um, back in the day, the 90s, AIM, uh, Jabber, Pigeon. So uh, Dan Reardon whipped up this 90s version of Jerry. I got the jean shorts. I got the, the big uh, dad shoes. You can see in the background, there is a... Um, a tower for holding my CDs. I do see a turbo button on the processor on the main computer there. A big, big A CRT monitor probably weighs like 30 pounds. There I am, got the folding chair. So thanks, thanks so much, Dan Reardon. Thanks so much, Haircut Fish. Got a really, really great. You can look here on the on the on the screen. We're actually rocking the um, Instant Messenger. Uh, so this is great. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks so much, Dan. Really, really well done. Let's get back to the news. Free PCs. CNBC sources say Google began a pilot where some employees use Internet free PCs as a potential way to improve cybersecurity. Employees in the pilot can only access internal web based tools and Google owned sites. Users on these machines will also not have any root access as a further precaution. Initially, the company selected over 2,500 employees for the pilot, but revised it to allow for volunteers and for selected employees to opt out. Sit. Um. All right, so this sucks. Um, okay, so I'm going to be real for a second. Both as an end user and as a cyber professional, I'm conflicted about this policy, okay? So one of the ways that we can prevent and you <laughs> one of the ways we can keep Carl from downloading stupid stuff or falling victim to um you know landing phishing pages mal uh, even drive by malvertising right one of the ways we can do that is by restricting access now uh this will work because you're basically nerfing them all together if if they never if they never, like, here's the thing. If you never walk into a landmine field, then you have a 0% chance of getting blown up by a landmine, right? If you walk through a landmine field, there is some percentage of chance that you will get blown up. But if you remove that altogether, there you go. And that's what Google's trying to do. Now, as an end user perspective, guys, let's be real. In 2023, people are doing personal stuff on their work computers all the time. Like who, like right now, like you probably have a tab open with your personal email in addition to your work email, right? Like, like everyone does it. Everyone knows about it. Businesses are fine with it as long as you get your work done, but it introduces risk, which is why we spend so much time trying to educate end users on these risks. Cause we know that it's a given that they're going to get exposed to these landmines. Now, 
there is a, a case to be made that this is going to be really detrimental to end users experience quality of life like i'd be pissed if i you know like if say you had to go to the aut like dude if you've ever worked i'm sorry to jump around but if you've ever worked in a skiff a secured classified um facility right i know some of you are prior uh, military and you've done this dude when you get in a skiff it blow uh, ooh, it stinks sorry about that because like yeah you're just focused on work but like you can't access a lot of the resources that you normally access because you're not on you're not on the internet basically so i don't know i don't think i'd want to work somewhere where like i couldn't like for eight hours i didn't have access to the internet because the way my brain works you know it's like oh i got uh, something quick or like oh hey like i got a I got a notification that I have to pay like my HOA fee. Like, let me just knock that out real quick and get back to work. Right. So, so I see what Google's doing to me, the they're, they're piloting this right to me, the outcomes of the pilot is not around how secure the computers were uh, for the employees that were in the pilot. To me, this is much more around what is the human dynamics of the employees subjected to this pilot. That's where I would go. Um, okay. Now, the, the the final thing I'll say is like, when we talk about, you know, access, right? We don't want we don't want people driving around with their domain admin creds as their daily driver. Meaning, you really it's called least privilege, right? So let's get our Security Plus book out or our CISSP book and thumb to chapter four access. Least privilege is basically giving someone the access that they require to do the job that they need, and that is it. That is a fantasy um, because it sounds great to say it on paper. And if you're a one person shop or three people and you have very easy to control resources, yeah, you can do that. But in reality, any business of like, I'd say 30 people or more, which is most businesses, um, you're going to run into, hey, Alana just started today. She's doing GRC with Jerry. Give her the same access as Jerry. Done. Well, Jerry's been here for 10 years and worked in four different departments. So now Alana's got 10 years worth of access. That happens all the time. It's a pervasive issue. So least privilege, it's a fantasy, uh, but it is a good thing to say. And everybody should know about it if you're going to take a certification exam. But it's wicked hard to implement this this policy is very similar to least privilege. They're saying you don't need access to the internet to do your job. All it's doing is adding risk to you. Uh, excuse me, adding risk to our business. So no, you're not going to get it. Okay, thank you. And Adobe rush out exploited zero day patches. Security researchers at Rapid7 warned that attackers began exploiting these remote code execution vulnerabilities. Citrix issued patches for its most critical vulnerability earlier this week, impacting Netscaler ADC and Gateway products. This vulnerability allowed for code execution with no authentication. Adobe also patched one of three recently exploited cold fusion vulnerabilities. However, Rapid7 researchers discovered the patch could easily be defeated with trivial changes. Adobe said it began work on a more complete fix. In addition, the researchers also discovered another critical cold fusion vulnerability hadn't been patched, but had been listed as closed due to a typo in a security notice. All right, so two things. One, I don't know why they buried this. Um, this story mostly talked about cold fusion zero days, but like the last paragraph, they're like, hundreds of organizations have been uh, compromised because of a go anywhere exploit. To me, this is like, <laughs> this is the lead Bro, like a lot of people use Go Anywhere. A lot of small businesses use Go Anywhere. If you're running Go Anywhere or you're an MSP and you're providing services for small businesses and you use Go Anywhere to uh, remote into their boxes, you should definitely be aware of that. Um, this is basically just a heads up patch Tuesday kind of message, right? If you're running Cold Fusion, do it. Um, and, and, you know, that's basically it. Um, they talk about, uh, what is this? Project discovery? What is this? Um, I don't know what this is. I got, have you guys heard of this project discovery? Is this like a, just a blog or is this actually like something with Google? 
I don't know. Anyways, um, this is just basically updates and patches. No big deal. It's like business as usual. The one thing I will uh, kind of share with the community that that is more of a, it's borderline jaw jacking. But like, um, uh, here, I'm going to actually start a poll really quickly uh, around cold fusion. Um, are you seeing cold fusion in prod? I, here, I'm just asking the community because I, I, you know, I only know what I see and what I, you know, like I asked the community a while back if people were using Fat Client Outlook and the community was split 50-50. And I was kind of surprised about that because I didn't think anyone did. Dude, Cold Fusion? I haven't, uh, like literally, I haven't seen Cold Fusion since 2001. Like I, th Cold Fusion, if I'm not mistaken, I might be getting this wrong, but Cold Fusion is basically like a, uh, it like allows you to create websites. Uh, with like, you know, a little bit of like functionality, but dude, in the world of modern web apps with React and, um, oh geez, I forget the other ones. Like React's a big one. Node.js, I think. Like I haven't heard of Cold Fusion in a minute, dude. And by a minute, I mean like a decade. So I don't know who the heck is using Cold Fusion that this thing gets top billing uh, on a major uh, news outlet, Ars Technica. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe if Carl, maybe if Carl's running some legacy app in the back to like, you know, interface with some type of legacy technology, whatever. This is a pre-auth RCE, which is really, really nasty. Um, if you get, if you hear the phrase unauthenticated remote code execution, Get your suspenders and your belt because you're going to want to double down on protection. That is the worst. Unauthenticated means they don't have to log in in any way, so they don't need to compromise a, an account or user. And remote code execution means they can fire it from the moon. So if you're picking up what I'm putting down, that is awful. Um, so anyways, let's see what chat says here. 45 people, 93% say uh, they haven't, they're not seeing cold fusion. So that's consistent with what I'm seeing. Thank you. UN holds meetings on AI. The United Nations Security Council held its first meetings on this emerging technology this week. Dreamweaver! <laughs> Alex, that's funny. I forgot about that. founder of Anthropic, Jack Clark, as well as the co-founder of the China-UK Research Center for AI Ethics and Governance, Professor Zhang Yi. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres supported calls by some Security Council states for creating a UN body similar to the International Atomic Energy Agency to support collective efforts to govern this extraordinary technology. Oh, Jesus. I pushed the wrong button. Hold on one second. Ukraine. Okay, really quickly. So, uh, obviously, Cat GPT. Shall we play a game? Um, major players in major power positions globally are all talking about AI. Um, I'm a little dismayed with the speed at which they're talking. Like, I, I almost lost my mind, uh, like, two weeks ago on stream because... Uh, the United States Senate is like putting a committee together to talk about AI in in like October, and and I, I I lost my mind. I'm like, dude, you're moving with the speed of a bloated bureaucratic republic, and AI is moving at the speed of grease lightning. Like, you really need to get your act together and move much faster. Uh, but whatever, it is what it is. So the UN is getting together. Um, you know, uh, good AI. I don't. I don't know. I don't think AI is an existential threat at the moment. Uh, we we have a lot of like Skynet and Terminator stuff. Um, AI is super powerful. We're getting it seen baked into things. I'm firmly in the camp that I think AI is going to help people do their job better, not replace people. Although <laughs> if you talk to the Writers Guild in Hollywood right now, um, those fat cats who are making money, cash, who run those studios, um, they have different ideas, but uh, that's a different story. Maybe for the SC Cafe jawjacking, th there isn't much here. Like, dude, like, you know, the big wheels of, of global power are turning. Proud Mary keeps on burning, right? Whatever. I mean, we'll see what happens. Until there's actually, um, until there's actually policy and action and things being done and implemented and controls being put in place 
Um, you know, I'll just keep my eye on it from a distance. But like the UN, the United States, global powers, they need to move faster. I'm a little disappointed in the speed with which they're moving. It takes down massive bot farm. In a joint operation, the cyber police and units from the Ukrainian National Police executed 21 search operations across two dozen locations in three cities to disrupt the bot farm. These bots served to push Russian propaganda, spread illegally obtained personal information, and other efforts to spread misinformation. In the operation, police seized over 250 GSM gateways, as well as about 150,000 SIM cards. Ukrainian police and security <laughs> services have continually worked to take down Russian-linked bot farms and misinformation infrastructure since the country began its invasion of Ukraine. All right. Uh, <laughs> shit, I almost knocked my coffee over. Um, BSEC, thanks for getting the Proud Mary, uh, Credence, uh, line. Um, this picture is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, well, here we go. All right, we're an equal opportunity, uh, community here on Simply Cyber. So if it's Ukrainian police, Europol, Interpol, feds, local police, whatever, uh, if they're if they're implementing law enforcement and bringing justice, then the regulators, uh, Chief Wiggum, where's my Chief Wiggum? Hold on, where's my Chief Wiggum? We have these emote squad members. We got to use them. There's Chief Wiggum. Um, okay, dude. So check it out. When you have money and resources and focus, then you can execute on these things. So Ukraine took down a bot farm. Um, and 150,000 SIM cards. So here's the deal. Uh, there are controls in place. There's controls in place to, um, like if you had one phone, right? Or one computer with a script that was going to post to like 200,000 different Twitter accounts, it would be really easy for Twitter or the servers or whoever to identify like, oh, these are all coming from the same account or same device, like shut it down. Like John Taffer, shut it down, right? So what they end up doing is in order to make it look more real and make it more difficult for defenders to identify that it is malicious, they have 150,000 SIM cards, cell phones, right? So uh, this is this is a industrial grade setup in order to do a very specific objective and that is to push misinformation right we saw this very well done uh in 2016 u.s uh elections also saw it in brexit for my uk people go watch the netflix documentary the great hack and what cambridge analytica did i can't i haven't i haven't promoted that documentary in a while but it is germane to this conversation the great hack cambridge analytica on netflix you will be happy you did they took down this you know this is basically rooting out a disinformation misinformation mechanism so good on them um all this does is slow a threat actor down in this case russia it only slows russia down it's not russia has lots of money and they can stand up another one of these or they have several of these now the good news is it does it does it, it's like it's like um it's like throw you know like those bolos um where they like throw it it's got like a ball on either end and it's like a rope in the middle and someone's running and, and they'll throw it and it'll get wrapped around their feet and they'll fall down and smack their face on the ground like that's what this is right so russia's running with their misinformation capability and ukraine whips one of these bolos russia gets tangled up and smacks their face on the ground and for a moment they are not moving forward they're not driving that mission but it's in this instance it's just a matter of time until they untangle the bolo get up and start running again so i would not be surprised you know if there's more of these already in existence or this gets stood back up guys it's too effective a capability and it's too part of their it's too much a part of their ttps or their 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 mo for executing their missions and initiatives um for them not to do it it's the same with like dark web marketplaces dude it, one goes down another one's going to come up because it's too effective at what it does so anyways good for ukraine good for um you know 
good, good for them. Like, you know, misinformation is awful, right? When it comes to data, compliance, and reducing risk. What... All right. So that sounds like that's going to do it for the stream today. So really quickly before you go, my 275 friends, uh, I want to remind everybody later today, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, it's 9 a.m. Eastern Time where I am right now. So uh, at the end of the business day today, I will be live uh, with a one-hour fireside chat with Ipsec. Ipsec, really well-known YouTuber, hacker, content creator, uh, educator. He's got like a million Hack the Box videos. He works for Hack the Box. He's, he's got his own Nmap scan. Like, dude is legit. Um... And I'm very excited to have him on and just talk to him, see what he has to say, have him share his experience with us. If you got questions, bring them with you, um, and we'll have a good uh, we'll have a good time. I'm super pumped. This is Ipsec is completing my like offensive security pen tester gauntlet that I've been on. We had John Hammond, Nahamsek, and now Ipsec. I'm like. S so happy so so happy um that these these uh practitioners were able to take time out of their busy schedule and come share their experience with the simply cyber community it's going to be a great show today so definitely come check it out i'll drop a link in chat uh if you guys want to grab that ipsec interview all right all right very cool now if you're here just for the news um Thank you so very much. Uh, th thus concludes your uh, threat briefing. I'm Jerry. We'll be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time with the next stream. Uh, be sure to tell a friend <laughs> and bring them next time. If you are a first timer, I hope you come back. I hope you got value. Um, and uh, we'll do it again. So now, uh, if it pleases the community, I would like to shift gears and get into the SC Cafe and... Uh, have a little jaw jack in time. So, all right, here we are at the SC Cafe. As I stand up that YouTube channel, um, I'll end this stream and kick it over to that one. But until that happens, we're not going to do that. Um, let me see. Uh, I want to do one blog post really quickly if the community's cool with it. Uh, let me see. Um. Uh, Let's see, securing software at server pet. All right, here we go. Um, here, there we go. Let me see what's going on with this one. This looks like server patching. We did talk about patching on the stream today. So maybe this is server patch management, best practice and tools. Here you go. This is a affiliated blog post link. So if you click on this, Simply Cyber may result in getting a fee, hashtag ad. I think these are all the things I have to say. But basically, um, if you want like some, basically two things. One, if you want some guidance on server patch management best practices, uh, go here. And if you'd like to have uh, this company donate to Simply Cyber on your behalf, <laughs> click the link. So thanks so much uh, for that. Let's do some jaw jacking. I saw Sean had some uh, something happen in chat. Um, what did Sean get? Can can um, hold on. Jenny clicked it here. Oh oh shit! Shoot, Sean has his interview right now in in two minutes. All right, guys, can we collectively as a as a as a community send good vibrations here? I'm gonna send hacker, hacker man, and Oprah. All right, that is for Sean Washington, a uh, longtime Simply Cyber community member. He's part of Cybersecurity Central. He's a really nice guy, great contributor to the community, and he's got a job interview in two minutes. So I am sending good vibrations. Thank you, Nicole. I am sending good vibrations right now to Sean. Marcus Seiler, first timer at DEF CON. Boom, baby, boom. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Uh, hold on. Whoa. Uh, Wahab. Wahab says, uh, for patch management, do we need to put a department to be only responsible for patching systems or can we hire a third party? Uh, you can hire a third party if you want. Typically, here's the thing. Patching is one of those things where like information security wants it done, but IT has to do it. And this is why you bring donuts 
to the IT team on Thursdays because you need to make friends with them and you need them to make your priorities their priorities. Okay, it's actually one of the conflicts um, in our industry. Uh, let me keep looking at chat. Shout out to Jenny Housley. Guys, just so you know, Jenny Housley, uh, she's one of the mods in chat. She's also just a wonderful human being. Um, she has been taking it upon herself to, to screen cap your questions and drop them in uh, mod chat so I can so I can get to them faster. It's way more optimized for being able to engage with you all. So thank you, Jenny. Frank says, this job interview I'm going for today for the help desk wants me to know ITIL. This is a first time for me. All right, Frank, um, you got two hours to learn ITIL. Here's the thing. What do you need to know about ITIL? Actually, you know what? Uh, okay, so two things. One, ITIL is a ITIL is a framework for delivering IT services to a business. It's got its pros, it's got its cons. What I would do, um, let me see if I can do this really quickly. Let's see, I would go to Bard. Let's go to Bard and say, hey, I have a job interview for help desk in two hours. Explain to me, uh, they want me to know about ITIL. Tell me five things that are most relevant to the help desk position. All right, now I'm gonna say the IT help desk position at a company. And if I knew what kind of company it was, Frank, that would also be valuable. Tell me the five things that are most relevant to IT help desk position at a company um, regarding ITIL. I want to impress my interviewers. Boom, let's see, give us a, give me a list, baby. All right, well that, all right, here you go. Um, here you go, Frank. Here are five things. Incident management, problem management, change management, service desk, self-service. Boom. How do I, um, can I, how do I, can I send this to you? How do I copy this? Copy. Um, hey, Frank, I'm going to drop this in Discord. Um, here. Uh, for Frank. Regarding ITIL. There you go, Frank. Nailed it. Um, and Frank, if you're not on the Discord, go to simply, just do exclamation point Discord and chat and you'll get there. And then in the general chat channel, um, you'll, you'll, th there you go. And hopefully that gets you the job. Come back tomorrow and explain that you just crushed it. I'd love it. Um, hold on one second. I'm getting, oh, wow. Okay. Haircut fish. Uh, I copy that. All right, let's keep going. Mod chat. Um, Matt McDaniel. Anyone first time DEF CON? I will be there. Uh, yeah, um, Marcus Seiler is going to be a first timer. Guys, I'm going to be organizing, very loosely organizing, a meetup for the Simply Cyber community. There is a, uh, a brewery uh, that looks really, really cool. It's down the south end of the strip. And um, I... Um, I tried to, I, I called them and I tried to get like a reserved space and they're like, no, <laughs> I was like, all right. So, um, I'm just going to go there. I'll communicate all of it. But if, if, if you guys want to get together, I'm trying to organize that, uh, James McQuiggan with the, um, with the super chat got accepted to the chess tournament. Wow. Just best yep. Thank you so much, James McQuiggan, super pumped for the super chat, super pumped for you to bring your chess skills to bear on everybody. James McQuiggan with another super chat earlier. I missed it. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, same same thing. Can we just become best friends? Yep. Dude, James McQuiggan, um, he like he tunes up on me. Uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. James McQuiggan tunes up on me on chess. Uh, if you're into chess, I am on chess.com. Uh, my user handle is Jerry Guy. James McQuiggan is I slay Jerry Guy. That's probably his handle. All right. Um, Tom Parrish says, I can't get your new book even though I received the email. What's up? What are you talking about, Tony? There's a link in the URL. Like, hold on. Guys, if you... I don't know, Tony. Um, 
let me see. Tony, you're talking about this book? If you go to this book and you put your email address here in this full form field, you will get an email. The email, um, here, give me a second. I'll show you the email. Uh, give me a second. Um, oh my God. Um, uh, let me see. Um, bro, I, hold on. I, I want to show everybody the email, the email, the email, uh, uh, the email. You guys remember strong bad from Homestar runner. <laughs> um, let me see. Gosh. Um, how do I, I, I can't find this right now, unfortunately. So, but believe me, sorry. I'm like, I'm, I'm grasping for wanting to, I wasn't prepared for this question. So I didn't have this at the ready. Uh, let me see really quickly. Yeah. Okay. So look at this. Hold on one second. Let me make sure that I'm not dossing myself here. All right. Can I, how do I, can I do this here? So like, this is the email you're going to get. Like I can't, the email subject line is going to be your cybersecurity breakthrough access something, right? This right here, can you see this on stream? This right here, this is the link to the book. You click this link and you, and you get, oh my God, I, can't, I wasn't prepared to do this. This isn't good for stream, but anyways, Tony, this is the link. If you got this email, you click on this link, you will get the book. Um, let me, I'm going to, here, I want to click on it and just confirm really quickly. Let's do this. Yeah. Look it. If you click on the link, you get the book. Like, I just clicked on it. So I'm not sure what's happening. All right. Let me keep rolling on this. Um... Uh, okay. Sorry. Getting caught up here. Um, oh my gosh. Micah, Micah's got a sock analyst position later today. Crush it. Ah, so Eric Taylor. Okay. So this is interesting. This is an interesting conversation. So Frank, Frank has an interview later today. Right. And uh, this is an open discussion for the community um, because I respect Eric Taylor and I want I want to discuss this. OK, so Eric. So Frank, community member, just a few minutes ago said I got an interview uh, later today at 11 a.m. for a help desk position and they want me to know about ITIL. Frank doesn't know about ITIL. I suggested asking Bard for five things that you'd want to know about ITIL. Um. The question is, am I promoting a fake it till you make it mindset? Because Frank will not actually be trained in ITIL, but will have knowledge in ITIL. Now, obviously, I'm going to defend my position, but I'm open to, I'm very open to uh, conversation. So my, my position would be, this is researching ITIL, right? You're not going to, you're not going to say I've been trained in ITIL. You're not going to say I've worked in ITIL. You're simply going to say, I know you guys are doing ITIL and I did research on it to be more familiar with it. These are the things that I've heard of. And this is how I see help desk integrating with ITIL and how I could be service to you. If you ever misrepresent your experience or your knowledge in a job interview, that's not a good thing. That's kind of um, fraudulent, right? Uh, so I guess that's my position. I'm not suggesting you lie about your experience. What I am trying to say is this is like you would do research on anything. So I'm not a big fan of fake it till you make it personally because 
I feel like if you fake it till you make it, yes, you might be able to score that job or get in there, uh, but then you're instantly going to be at risk because you you have misrepresented who you are. Um, so I'll be interested in chat. Um, Frank says, I've worked IT help desk for 17 years. It's the first time being asked about it. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a push the last several years of using ITIL to be more efficient with delivering IT services to a business and being able to have metrics, more importantly, um, on doing that. So, okay. Uh, I know, like, there's a lot of people talking and also talking about what I just brought up. So I'll, I'll kind of fold it in. But I appreciate Eric um, Eric asking the question and uh, us having the conversation about it or allowing me the opportunity to uh, further clarify my point. Uh, Shuttlecrab says, I have to create a security case as part of my cyber apprenticeships. Any recommended frameworks or methods? Um, mm, Shuttlecrab, I'd have to get more information on what you mean by security case. Like, are you saying like, a concept on how to implement a control at a business? Are you talking about walking through an incident? Like, I don't know what security case means, so it's hard to explain. But as an apprentice, uh, I would recommend either CIS 18 as a framework or uh, NIST CSF as a framework um, to kind of shape your approach. Jared K says, hey, Jerry, I'm the only InfoSec person at a small nonprofit where you have to completely comply with all the controls in 171. Could you suggest a tool Ugh. Uh, yeah, 920 will be fine. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so, all right. Complying with 171 will be challenging. Uh, if you want a tool, uh, I guess the easiest way to do it would be uh, with Excel, right? So dump out all the controls. There's got to be a, a crosswalk already developed somewhere, but... The, the hardest way to do it without any knowledge um, of, of what's available. Oh, hell, let's just do it right now. I'm Googling NIST 800-171 control crosswalk. Um, the second bullet says mapping disclaimer. I'm going to drop it in my downloads. I'm, I'm now opening this. And let's take a look. Uh, okay, here we go. So here we go. Uh, who asked that question? Jarrett K. So Jarrett, Jarrett, there's a link to a, a spreadsheet that looks like it's built off of NIST CSF, uh, but has the control mapping for 800-171. Start with that. Um, Again, I, you'd have to look at how this thing is mapped out. Um, it does say that some 800-171 requirements are not mapped to CSF. Um, so you'd have to be mindful of that. Actually, I'm sorry. This is just the CSF to 171 mapping. Um, oh my God, what is going on here? Google Google, Google has now just in, 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 in pushed me into a... Uh, experimental search lab thing. Thank you, Google. Um, anyway, like anyways, all you want to do, Jarrett, is get an 800 spreadsheet with a crosswalk. Look at all the controls. If you really wanted to do it, um, this is going to be work. This is probably a month of work. You have to go conduct an audit against all of those controls and figure out what your current implementation status is. You could try to farm it out by sending the IT people a questionnaire, HR a questionnaire, general counsel a questionnaire, take a best guess effort, um, and then get your current state, do a gap analysis on what is not in place, explain to the business what's not in place. You'll want to develop a POAM, P-O-A-M, which is plan of action and milestones. I guarantee you, I guarantee, guarantee, guarantee you, you are not 100% 800-171 compliant. You will not be able to get compliant with a snap of a finger if you document gaps um, and have a plan on how to close those gaps. Good to go. You can also, um, certain controls you can tailor out. This is a more advanced GRC function, but you can tailor certain controls out. So like, let's say, 
Um, this is like a silly, silly example, but let's say there's a control in there around physical media protection, right? Like all, all physical paper will be kept in a filing cabinet under lock and key, but your business has no physical paper. You're an absolute fintech crypto bro business, right? Like whatever you could say that control is not applicable because we don't have, like we're not gonna buy a filing cabinet with a lock and key because we don't have physical paper. This is tailored out. So you're still compliant with it in a sense, but you're not actually implementing it if you're picking up what I'm putting down, okay? So be mindful of that. It's a, it's a great bit of work. When CMMC drops, that's gonna be a thing. All right. Uh, Sublime Ghost says, random question. What's your take on Cloudflare Zero Trust Platform? Uh, Sublime, I don't really know. Um, I'm not familiar with Cloudflare's Zero Trust Platform, so unfortunately I can't c comment on that. Wahab, Wahab, for thread hunting, where to start? I didn't see so much resources and courses for thread hunting. Um, you know what's funny? Um, what's his face? Husky Hacks. Um Hold on. Husky Hacks just did a major video drop with John Hammond and some other studs um, around thread hunting. I haven't looked at it yet, but this, as far as I know, this is like a dope resource. This is called... Hold on. This is only 55 seconds? What? All right. Hold on one second. So, I mean, this isn't... This is only 55 seconds, so I was actually hoping for more. Um, but... Um, Thread hunting is finding bad. I guess what I would say is, um, I don't have a good, does anti-siphon have a thread hunting? Anti-siphon might have thread hunting. Let me search. No. Nope. All right. Um, I'd be, yeah, I guess I, I, I'm sorry. I don't really have good. Let me see this thread hunting training anti-siphon. Let's see. All right. Yeah, here we go. I knew they'd have something. So Chris Brenton has an advanced network thread hunting course. Um, obviously it's, it's $575. It is 16 hours. I, I would argue that it's probably like, it's probably very good. Um, but it's not free. Okay. Um, so there you go. Hopefully that helps. All right. Let's keep going here. Um, your phone picks look like, okay. Uh, Let's see, last one here. Oh, my man, Jesse. Jesse Johnson, how long will you be with IPSEC? I wanna bring everyone that shows up to the study group to stream. Oh, yeah, we'll be there from 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern time, Jesse. So, 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern time. Uh, Steve says, have you ever listened to the podcast Hacker in the Fed is really good? No, I haven't. Oh, hey, Jack Scott is saying that INE has a really good um, thread hunting course. Let's check that out. Thanks, Jax. Thread hunting. Oh man, it's like an entire. Here, check this out. I N E thread hunting, and this is recommended by um, Jax, who is a boss in the space. Hacker in the Fed. Let's check that out. Um. Oh, thanks, Leroy. Good to have you. Hacker and the Fed. Uh, let's check it out. Dropping this in chat for everybody. I will add this. You know what I'm actually going to do? Let me do this. Let me do this. Let me add this. You can see my uh, my playlist. The Midnight Instrumental. The Midnight Discography. Simply Cyber Hip Hop. <laughs> A lot of Midnight. Uh, let me go ahead and follow this. So thank you. I will check out this uh, recommended podcast. I appreciate that, guys. All right. 187 of you beautiful people here. What else we got here? Yep. So, um, 
yeah, just just be uh, be real in your interviews. Be transparent. All right. So Jack Scott says she took the course. I love it. Uh, hey guys, another thing. So there's a lot there's a lot going on um, for me personally. All good things. Okay. So nothing nothing bad. So don't sweat that. But um, you know, the next couple months is going to be really uh, amazing and impactful, and a lot of crazy cool stuff happening. Um, got the Cyber 101 course going full steam. Going to be going into the uh, Buffer Osier Flow studio in the backyard pretty soon. Um, I'll have, you know, behind the scenes stuff for you guys around that. Um, the missus is putting built-ins back there. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot more for Simply Cyber uh, in, starting in September. Uh, I will, uh, like, I'm excited to be, like, taking courses like that Miter Attack Frameworks with Black Hills. Um and in sharing that experience and doing doing it with you like one of the like so one of the big initiatives that i want to do in q4 is take cyber training but take it alongside other people if people are available and want to take it and the idea is that um you know i'm hoping that i can take it learn myself but then also uh if you're like new to cybersecurity or you're you know, new to it or whatever being able to give greater context to some of the things that we're learning in the class um, and, and, and help you get a more richer experience from that learning opportunity. Um, we're going to try it. We'll see how it goes. Um, I want to do the, um, I want to do that miter attack one. Where is it? I want to do this miter attack one, but I also want to do, um, Getting started with uh, uh, MITER and John Strand. That's September 18th. I want to do that one. It's a four-day course. Um, I love John Strand. I I've already made a video on the channel for active defense and cyber deception. I want to do this one. So uh, that's like a, a big thing that I'm super excited to do. Um... Oh, hey, uh, this just in. This just in. Um... This is a free threat hunting course. So do the free stuff first, always. But this is coming from Kim. Uh, definitely check that out. Yeah, get a cert with a mentor. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to do here. Uh, is it a good idea to integrate threat intel open source feeds into firewalls so it can automatically block malicious IOCs? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good practice, Wahab. I mean, certainly, certainly good. But remember, just remember by the time here, I mean, uh, it's good to do, but what I will say is, and hey, uh, chat fact, check me on this one on the David Bianco pyramid of pain, IP addresses are way at the bottom and they're very easy for threat actors to change. So oftentimes, by the time you're getting an IP address in your IOCs, it, it, that IP address is already burned and the threat actor is already rotated. So it's not a bad practice, but the value that it's going to deliver to your organization is not material. So just, you know, FYI on that. And, and by the way, if someone in chat has a different opinion... Uh, please share it. I mean, I've only got my experience, right? I'm not, I haven't implemented at, you know, thousands of organizations. So welcome Billy DP. Dude, aren't you all drugged up right now, Billy? When you get your wisdom teeth out, don't they like gash you up? Uh, ben Middleton says, are we going to be able to have a calendar of events for classes? Yeah, Ben, um, stay tuned. That is a great idea to properly communicate. Um, I actually have a calendar um, with like who's who I'm going to be interviewing on the live streams on Thursday. Um, where is it? I have a calendar. It's not public. I share it with a couple people, but it is a good idea. I would love to have a public Simply Cyber public community calendar um, for stuff I'm working on, but also if there's people in the organization, um, in the organization, in the community who are putting on things like Jesse Johnson's doing a security uh, study group, security plus study group. So maybe, I don't know if Jesse's doing it like, you know, fixed schedule, like every Thursday or something like that. But if he is, we could add that to the calendar 
and it'll be like a community calendar. So it's a great idea. Thank you for suggesting it. And I will, um, I will do that. And Ben, I hate to be like a pain in the A, but like, if you can, if I don't do it in September, remind me and I will do it. Um, uh, yeah, Matt McDaniel, I agree. Billy DP, I hope you're all right, bud. Uh, yeah, Chris K. Hall, so many book arcs. That's right. What's the best practice to deal with threat intel feeds? Um, I mean, it depends what you want to do with it. Um, all right, Jax, be good. Jax gets an anime wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jax. Uh, really appreciate you being in the community. By the way, Jax was on LinkedIn the other day with her I Heart Nist shirt. Uh, love it, love it, love it. I do Heart Nist and uh, appreciate appreciated seeing that. Uh, Leonardo says, look for visual threat intel by Thomas Rochia. Let's check that out. Visual threat intel, um, Thomas Rochia. Let's check it out. Doink. Ooh, got the ninja, hooded ninja. Oh, this looks cool. An innovative, concise guide for detailed explanations. Oh, holy crap, this looks awesome. Uh, here, I'm going to drop this in chat. Um, Thank you for recommending this. Leonardo, I'm going to buy this uh, right after the stream ends. I don't want to buy it on stream because I don't know with Amazon. Who I don't know if you're going to see my address or my phone number or my credit card or all that crap. So we'll do that afterwards. But I'm going to buy that, Leonardo. I respect Leonardo's um, offensive security skills and information security skills. And if he's saying this looks legit then uh, I'm on board Team Leonardo. So thanks for that recommendation, dude. All right. Where are we at? We're at 926. I'm going to drop the... I'm going to end the meeting at the bottom of the hour. So at 930. Uh, so we got four minutes. Guys, great stream today. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for hanging out. I really am excited Again, one of the big things that's going to be coming is the SC Cafe. Um, if you guys don't know about it, let me tell you. Oh my gosh, let me let me show you. There it is. This is just like a working a working prototype. This isn't this isn't the final. But um, yeah, the, the Simply Cyber Cafe, like. Basically, I'm going to start another YouTube channel that is much more designed for, like, Simply Cyber, the channel we're on right now, that's going to be the pro channel. That's going to be for, you know, the streams and, and interviews and stuff like that. And Simply Cyber Cafe is going to be for things like this, AMAs, jaw jacking, um, um, just chill streams, right? So think of Simply Cyber Cafe as the casual weekend Jerry and Simply Cyber is Monday through Friday, nine to five, Jerry. That's basically what's up. Oh yeah, Matt McDaniel's reading. This is how they tell me the world ends. So, so good, so good. Uh, yeah, I know, Emilio. I saw my zip code on there. That's okay. Uh, Fancy Bear Goes Fishing, The Dark History of the Information Age and Five Extraordinary Hacks. Holy crap, that's quite a title. Oh, Steve, uh, no, no, no. The SC Cafe is going to be like a new YouTube channel altogether. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make, I'm going to make merch with this logo on it too. Cause I want to wear it, <laughs> but yeah, this is going to be cool. I'm super pumped about it. Uh, Jenny, what was the name of that? Um, fancy bear gone fishing. Let's check that out. Uh, here we go. Holy crap. Look at this. Scott Shapiro. Bro. You guys, are, I'm going to, my, my wife's going to be like, why are we getting so many <laughs> Amazon packages? This looks great. Oh my God. All right, guys. I'm buying this one too. Holy crap. 
There is a book club on Simply Cyber's Discord server, just so everybody knows. There is a Discord server. I mean, a book club. And uh, we might be doing all of them. Oh my god, so good. I'll put, I'll put a link in chat to this one too. Thanks, Jenny. Oh, hold on. Uh, copyright. Let me do Jonathan Bell. All right, guys. We're at one minute out. Yeah. Um, let's see. Jess Bishop is in chat. Good to see you, Jess. Um, it's like a mullet. Essie is business in the front. <laughs> Jesse Johnson. Yes. Simply Cyber is a mullet. <laughs> I love it. So funny. All right, guys. Thanks so much for hanging out on the Jaw Jacking Cafe segment. Um, hopefully you guys got value from the stream. I had a great time. Thank you all so very much for all you do. Uh, cyber help do... Ex Here, I'll do it. Exclamation point Discord in chat. Um, also, hey, by the way, guys, I think I'm going to get a new... Uh, I think I'm going to buy a custom URL for this one. But... Right now, if you go to um, this website, my link tree, right, it has all the things in here, right? So I don't know if you guys know this. I, I think I'm going to get a, a different URL so it's much easier to convey. But if you go to this URL, link tree, simply cyber, it has links to like all of the social. So like the Discord is right here. The LinkedIn's right here. If you want to email me, it's right here. The podcast is right here. The YouTube channel is right here, right? And then, you know, like, if you want to get on the email, if you want to download the book, if you, like, everything is right here. So, if you want to go to the website. So, yeah. It just it makes it easier. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much for all you do. Oh, that's a good idea, Alex. Put the, that is a great idea. Put the calendar here. Um, that's, that's brilliant. Um... Good, oh, good luck with the house hunting. Thanks, everybody, uh, for all you do. Simply Cyber Community. Um, you guys are why I show up every day and uh, love doing it. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. Good luck. Uh, hopefully, Sean is crushing his interview right now. Frank, good luck at 11. To all those who are uh, looking to break in, you got this. Best wishes for all those already in. Help those who are trying to break in. Be good to each other. And until next time, stay secure. Thanks, everybody. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one. Come